Good afternoon, hello, and welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is one in a series provided free to our clients and partners, and can be set against your continuous professional development requirements. It is being recorded and will be available to download from our website in due course. Our website, our webinar rather, today, will be discussing compliance with the PSC regime, the Person of Significant Control regime. And if I move the slide on, we can see just a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. As you see on the screen, we're going to have um, a little bit of definitions. What is a PSC? What is a person of significant control? What is a, a re relevant legal entity, an RLE? What's a majority stake? Uh, and then, as you can see, when, why, and how, and the, the uh, when you can comply, why you comply, and then a bit of looking into the future and uh, future gazing, so to speak. Uh, my name is Mark Craig and I'm Associate Director for the Company Secretariat Centre of Excellence here at uh, Vispera in Bristol. I'm joined today by my colleagues Martin Palmer, a consultant here at Vistra, and Karina James Wilcher, Senior Associate here at <coughs> Vistra Corporate Law. Hello. Hello. And as you can see on this slide, um, without me reading it, Martin has been with us since the mid 80s, has a wealth of qualifications and experience in tax and company planning, and say even going as far as having written the book. And Karina here has uh, been with uh, Vistra for 13 years, is a fellow of qualified, uh, no, sorry, a fellow unqualified chartered legal executive and has a broad experience in PSC compliance. Due to the number of attendees in the call today, you've all been put on mute for the duration of this webinar. However, it is designed to be interactive and, and we do want to hear from you. Uh, so we'd be very grateful if you could email us with any questions throughout the session. You can see on screen at the bottom of the page, we've got Karina's email address, which is uh, for those who are listening only, K-A-R-I-N-A dot James dash Wiltshire at Vistra dot com. And you can see it on screen. Uh, please do send us any emails along the way. Uh, any uh, messages, any questions we don't manage to get through today will be after, uh, answered by email after the event. So without any further delay, I'm going to move on the slide to our first. So please, okay. Karina. Um, so the reason why I've chosen this slide is because it's a good rule of thumb. It's good practice not to make any assumptions when determining the PSC. And the reason for this is it's very easy to make incorrect um, PSC filings and your PSC information may be incomplete when you file it at Companies House. What is good practice is to go through each of the conditions in turn. One example of an assumption that has been made and I have seen it um, at Companies House is a company putting on all the directors that not that may not necessarily be correct and it's best to actually go through each of the conditions okay i'll look at each of these conditions in turn okay so who is a person with significant control and as we've said in short psc so there are five conditions and these are all found in schedule 1a of part one of the company's act 2006 and I look at the each one in turn. So X is a person with significant control if, in condition one, X holds directly or indirectly more than 25% of the shares in a UK company. Now to put that in context, if you had a company that, for example, had four shareholders and each of those individuals held 25 shares, your filings at Companies House would be there is no PSC because no one holds more than 25% of the shares. Looking at a different example, if you were to have a company with share classes, um, for example, A and B shares, and one individual held 50 A shares and the other held 50 B shares, then in that example, those two individuals will be filed at Companies House as persons with significant control. So moving on to condition two, X holds directly or indirectly more than 25% of the voting rights in a UK company. Now this condition would apply to both a company limited by shares and a company limited by guarantee. A guarantee company doesn't have shares, but the members hold voting rights. Now in this situation, 
looking back at the example of share classes where we had an individual that held A shares and an individual that held B shares, typically B shareholders have no voting rights so that individual would not be a PSC under this condition too. So moving on to condition three. X holds the right directly or indirectly to appoint or remove a majority of the board of directors of the UK company. Now in this situation, you would look at who holds 50% or more of the voting rights. And this would be by ordinary resolution generally, because it would be an ordinary resolution that would be passed to appoint or remove the board. However, you shouldn't stop there. If there are any conditions within a shareholders agreement, for example, where there are certain individuals that have the right to appoint and remove the board, those individuals would fall under condition three. And there may be bespoke provisions within articles that allow certain individuals to appoint and remove the board. So there are other documentation that should be looked at, whether it's the constitution or agreements. So moving on to condition four, X has the right to exercise or actually exercises significant influence or control over a UK company. Now, when the PSC regime was first introduced, there are a lot of companies that were using this condition incorrectly as a catch-all. And Companies House has recently um, released a leaflet and they have specifically stated that condition four is not a catch-all. There is um, guidance as to when you should use this condition and we will touch on this condition later on. And then lastly, condition five, this is a, a two part test, so to speak, to be able to fulfill and satisfy this condition, you must meet both parts A and B and it applies to trust or whether there's a partnership. Um, just uh, a, a couple of points from what Karina uh, has been saying. <clears throat> I think, first of all, when we look at conditions one to three, as Karina mentioned, it's possible for uh, an individual or a relevant legal entity to be a, a PSC by holding those shares or those rights indirectly. And we'll look at the rules for tracing indirect ownership uh, in a moment in, in, in the examples. And I think um, in relation to condition five, as Karina says, this is the test that has to be applied where either trustees of a trust or partners of a partnership own shares in a UK company. And uh, it's worth emphasizing the point Karina made. It's a two limb test. And the only persons that are registrable under condition five are the people that fall within limb B of the test. And the statutory guidance makes it clear that um, those uh, people um, are non-trustees or non-partners of a partnership. So um, I think that's probably yeah. the only comment I've got on yeah. that first yeah. slide. Sounds good. Um, so if uh, we look at the concept of uh, a relevant legal entity, um, first point to make is um, the person X uh, in conditions one to five, the person that is registrable will uh, almost always either be an individual or exceptionally um, a corporate that is a, a relevant legal entity. So this legislation is really focusing uh, in the main on individuals. It's hunting for individuals with significant control. And as an example of that, the governing regulations are called the People with Significant Control Regulations 2016. So if a corporate is going to go on the PSC register, it has to be a special kind of corporate. And this is what a relevant legal entity is. And uh, in short, a relevant legal entity is an entity that is subject to its own disclosure requirements. And that means either a, a legal entity that has to keep a PSC register under this legislation, so a UK company, or <clears throat> a legal entity wherever registered whose shares are admitted 
to trading on a regulated stock market, either within the European economic area or on specified markets in Switzerland, the US, Japan and Israel. Now, often you will encounter chains of relevant legal entities, typically UK companies in a group where you'll often have a top holding company, an intermediate holding company. And then in relation to acquisitions, you might have historically a big company and then the, 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 the main holding company of the group. And uh, the main uh, one of the main rules in relation to relevant legal entities is that the RLE, as we call it, is only registrable if it is the first relevant legal entity in the chain of ownership, but not otherwise in a chain of relevant legal entities. And this is probably best described uh, in diagram form. So uh, you'll see on the slide on the left, we have three UK companies. So they're all by definition relevant legal entities. X is an individual. And let's assume um, that uh, each shareholder owns 100% of the shares of the company um, below it in, in the diagram. So um, in this example, C Limited is a registrable relevant legal entity in relation to B Limited, but it's non-registrable in the PSC register of A Limited. Mm -hmm. and, and likewise with Mr. X, he is uh, a registrable person uh, on the PSC register of C Limited, but he's not registrable in the PSC registers of B Limited or A Limited. And essentially what the legislation is saying is it doesn't want duplication. It wants a methodical approach, a step-by-step -step approach rather than, for example, having Mr. X featuring in all three PSC registers or C Limited featuring in A Limited's PSC registers. Mm -hmm. I think earlier on that was a mistake that we were seeing, particularly with our formations, that people were hunting for an individual and it's not necessary that it's an individual, it's a registrable relevant legal entity mm -hmm. in this scenario, that would be the PSC. People make the mistake of going right through the chain and, and for example, UK Company A, they would put Mr X in thinking that they needed to seek an individual. So that was yes, a yes. common, a common a misunderstanding common and yeah. um, it's not because the legislation is simple. Uh, and another common error um, that uh, became prevalent as well was to, to register companies that weren't relevant legal Legends. entities. <clears throat> yeah. So we saw um, a number of offshore companies being registered uh, as PSCs of UK companies. And mm. of course, these offshore companies, if their shares aren't listed on the specified markets, they're not registrable uh, on the PSC register. And you have to look through that entity yeah. <clears throat> to discover if there are any individuals or relevant legal entities that are uh, indirectly owning mm. uh, the shares of the UK company. So I think both, yeah, both were common errors at yeah. the time. I think it's still happening as well. So um, let's go back to this issue of indirect ownership because the rules, certainly from our point of view, when we looked at them first, <clears throat> produced a surprising result. If you look at this example, we have a foreign registered company. And um, let's assume, as is typical, that that foreign registered company is not a relevant legal entity. So it's an unlisted foreign registered company. So that means that for X1 or X2 to be registrable, they have to indirectly own more than 25% of the shares uh, or, or voting rights of the UK company. And you would think that in this example that um, they would indirectly own 50% each. That, that would be the arithmetical conclusion. But in fact, the legislation um, operates in a way that's slightly counterintuitive. What, what it says is that 
to be an indirect owner through um, this company, there has to be a majority stakeholder. So only if X1 or X2 hold a majority stake will they be registrable on the UK company's PSC register. So in this example, you can't register the foreign registered company. It's not a relevant legal entity. So you're looking for a majority stakeholder. And in this case, the company is deadlocked. It's a joint venture vehicle. The slide sets out the um, definitions of a majority stake. And those are really not uh, particularly surprising. Um, so you have to hold a majority of the voting rights or be a member of the company and have the right to appoint or remove a majority of the board or be a member of the intermediate company and control by agreement with other members a majority of the voting rights. And then fourthly, you can be a majority stakeholder without being a shareholder or member if you have the right to exercise or actually exercise dominant influence or control. But the concept of dominant influence is a very narrow one. It's different from the concept of significant influence and control in condition four. And uh, it essentially requires the holder of the rights to give directions to the company in relation to its financial and operating policies, which the directors are obliged to follow by virtue of um, provisions in the company's constitution. So it's a very narrow application. But what is clear is that um, the, the normal tests of majority stakeholder do somewhat limit the, tra the transparency effects of the UK PSC regime. Uh, Martin, you used, we talked about this the other day, you used the word counterintuitive and I think it's exactly right because it goes against other things like the AML anti-money laundering rules and regulations worth, I think, emphasising. And in this example, and in many other examples we could deliver, there is a certain counterintuition associated with the um, with the majority stake and the uh, and the PSC uh, registers. Is that fair just to reiterate that point? That is uh, yeah, I think, unusual. I, I think so. And I think um, we were surprised at the number of entities, particularly offshore companies that this affected. Uh, but we found in the main where there was uh, a, a deadlock like this, they tended to be joint venture companies. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I suppose the temptation is then to consider whether um, this would be a way to, um, as it were, deliberately limit the, 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 the rules of the PSC regime because most of the offshore structures we encountered <clears throat> had been set up before this legislation came yeah. into effect. Mm. <clears throat> Whereas now, um, some clients might be tempted to say, well, let's, let's interpose an offshore company and maybe it's a, it, it would commercially have been a single member company, but a, a, a second individual is, as it were, brought in as a make weight. Yeah. And I think the, um, obviously the, the point there is that that can be countered by the PSC regime itself. Mm. Um, so that either uh, this would be what's called a, jo uh, a joint arrangement yeah. um, uh, and it, it's undone, uh, or um, let's say the make weight in this example is X2, X1 might de facto be a person exercising significant control of the UK company um, under condition four. Yeah. So, but but nevertheless, it's a it's an important I think an important point to make. Thank you. Okay, so looking at when you should comply on this slide, uh, I've put a, a few examples of when a company would need to comply with the PSC regime, and um, one where there's a transfer of shares, or if the company's been part of a buyback agreement of shares, or if there's been a new issue of shares. And there are various PSC forms that are used to notify a company's house of any of these transactions that are taking place. And I'll use the transfer of shares as an example. So where a company has um, completed a transfer of shares, there are a number of forms that would need to be filed at company's house. 
The first one being the PSC1 form, which would be the notification of who is the PSC. There's another form called um, the PSC04, which is where a person's shareholding would change due to the transfer. So person A may transfer some of their shares to person B and therefore their PSC information has changed. Or there may be a trans because of the transfer, the person no longer is a PSC and the PSC07 would be the form that you'd file at company's house to notify that that person is no longer a PSC. You'd also have to make sure that you would update the PSC registers. These are usually with your statutory books where you know to, you have in your statutory books, your register of members, your register of directors, so your PSC registers would be there. But it, it's, it should be noted that that not always would you have to notify a company's house of um, PS change of PSC because it may be that there's no change and I think that should always be remembered that yes we have got the PSC regime but it doesn't always necessarily mean that there is a PSC and that's an assumption that people think oh there should be a PSC and so they try and file if there is a PSC and they can make the error there. One second, we're having some technical difficulties here with turning the slide. Oh, that part came up next. There we go. Okay, why should you comply? This is a, a, a real letter that we we received from Companies House for one of our clients, and we've redacted the information due to um, data protection. But as you can clearly see there, the the letter says that um, nine individuals have been notified to companies' houses, the PSCs, and um, the letter clearly says that each of these nine individuals hold holds more than 75% or more of the shares, 75% more of the voting rights, and they have the right to appoint and remove um, the directors. Now, clearly that doesn't add up, and this company has actually in, has made incorrect filings at companies' house. And when the legislation first came came in force, Companies House wasn't very hot on actually looking at the information that was being filed. However, we've noticed in the last 12 months, they are actually looking through the public file to see which companies are filing the correct information. And those companies that are, there are not, they are actually notifying and this letter gives this company 14 days to comply. Now, the consequences of not complying is that there could be for the officers of this company, civil penalties, so a fine, or there could be criminal proceedings, and we'll touch on those a bit later. Why should you comply? Okay, there's some examples there of um, some high street banks. It's not an exhaustive list, it's just a few examples. And the reason why we've put this slide in is um, I had um, an accountant and call me because he was concerned that his client company had approached their high street bank to renew their facility agreement and the bank refused to renew the facility agreement because they simply went on company's house looked at the company details and from looking at the public file they went back to that client company and said your PSC information is incorrect and on that basis we will not be renewing your facility agreement. Once the PSC information was updated then the bank would be in a position to renew the agreement so consequences of making incomplete or incorrect filings are quite severe for companies. Just got real didn't it yeah. So um, what about the future? So clearly corporate ownership uh, of uh, assets or uh, businesses now give rise to strict transparency obligations. In the UK, of course, this information is um, available to the public. The uh, options for clients seeking confidentiality 
in their arrangements, certainly with UK companies are now a lot more limited than they once were. Some have suggested that trusts, which are um, by their nature uh, more private, uh, might be used in preference to companies for certain kinds of non-trading activity, for special purpose activity, for owning assets, for example. But I think there are two uh, caveats to that. The first one is, is very much a tax point that um, trusts give rise to very different uh, tax consequences and a very different tax regime to corporates. And therefore, um, before considering the use of a trust in preference to a company, it's very important to take uh, tax advice before beforehand. Otherwise, um, there could be costly tax oversights. I think the other point to make is that uh, although at the moment there is no public register of trust beneficiaries, for example, the spotlight is now very much on trusts. And certainly in the UK, there are now reporting obligations for discretionary trusts, for example, so that the, the trustees have to report uh, the key persons relating to, to a trust to HMRC where that trust is um, uh, generating tax liability. So the beneficiaries, for example, the settlor would have to be reported to HMRC. Uh, as I say, at the moment, this, this is not a, a subject to public disclosure, but nevertheless, the, the, the transparency regime for trusts is certainly being augmented. Um, as far as the um, other jurisdictions are concerned, then uh, the first point to make is that whilst the UK led the way, you can now assume that all the EU and EEA territories have in place some form of PSC regime based very much on the UK regime, uh, although perhaps with less accent on public disclosure. So the, UK, the EU and the EEA are very much uh, in line with the UK. The British Overseas Territories, by that I mean uh, the, the Caribbean Islands, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Nevis, Turks and Caicos, Anguilla, they are now on the road to um, the, the same regime as applies in the UK. So uh, there is an act, the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act, which has uh, set in train uh, the implementation of public registers in the British offshore or overseas territories. The order in council to start this process is due to occur next year. But what is interesting is that because of the resistance being shown by the British Overseas Territories, implementation has been put back at this stage to 2023. And there are some who, who believe that the Overseas Territories will be successful in, in resisting a PSC regime that involves public disclosure of PSCs. And if, if they're successful, um, which, which I think they might be, um, then that would certainly return the spotlight onto the UK because our regime is um, indiscriminately public in nature. Mm. There is a protection regime for those at um, risk of serious harm. Yeah. Um, but when you look at the regimes that are being implemented across the EU, uh, these regimes seem to, to provide more discretion to the authorities to withhold certain particulars in relation to individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the point the British Overseas Territories are making. And they have weight to their argument in that at the moment, the Crown dependencies of Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man um, have been successful in saying we'll implement a PSC regime, but we, we don't agree that it should be uh, public and that the PSC should be publicised in the way the UK regime is is publicised. Mm. Okay, so in February, Companies House released 
all the company's house forms um, due to the negotiations that are going on with the, the Brexit, whether there's going to be a Brexit deal or, or no deal. And the forms that they released were the no deal forms and those forms have removed all references to EEA and non-EEA corporate officers and instead they've replaced those with UK registered limited companies and other corporate bodies. When these forms will be live, we're still watching this space, but they have done the mammoth task of absolutely going through every single form and removing all these references. And, and you can contact us if you want to know when these forms go live. Just one more um, peer into the future. Um, there is now a bill uh, which has been published called the Registration of Overseas Entities Bill, and that will eventually become the Registration of Overseas Entities Act 2018, uh, which will uh, probably be enacted in 2021. So it's not in yet, but it will affect all overseas companies that own UK land and the land can be development land, it can be residential property, it can be commercial property. The target is very much offshore companies. Uh, as you might um, know, a material percentage of high value properties in London are owned through offshore companies and the government wants these entities to become much more transparent as to who, who owns them. And so uh, the registrar is going to create under the legislation a beneficial owner's register of overseas legal entities owning UK land. Unlike the uh, PSC regime, the offshore company will not have to maintain its own PSC register. So this is a register uh, a little bit like the central register that will be maintained by the registrar. Yeah. The persons that can be put on that register are of course individuals, so that's that again is the main target, or legal entities that are subject to their own disclosure requirements. So we're back to the <clears throat> familiar concept of a, an entity being allowed on the register because it, it is itself uh, subject to some form of transparency legislation. Yeah. The um, concept of a beneficial owner is essentially identical to that of a person with significant control and this um, particular legislation has borrowed very heavily from the legislation of the PSC regime. A lot of it is just being lifted and placed into the overseas uh, entities bill and as with um, the PSC regime, there will be criminal penalties, uh, civil penalties for non-compliance and restrictions on the land register uh, in relation to delinquent companies. So that means if somebody doesn't, um, if, if an offshore company doesn't comply with this legislation and it owns UK property, it will actually be unable yeah. to deal with that property. Um, so uh, significant sanctions there. So I think um, we're, we've come to the final slide, Karina, yeah. and um, we've, we, Karina and I thought it would be quite useful maybe to, to look at um, some sort of structure chart or organogram just to go through um, some of the concepts that we've been discussing uh, today. Yeah, it's useful to pull everything together. It's a little bit more advanced than our earlier slide, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's quite a complex structure and some of our portfolios would have this structure in, in, their, in their files. So we'll work from the bottom working up. So UK subsidy company there, the PSC, would be the UK target company and as Martin has explained that's because that UK target company is a registrable um, legal entity so that would be entered into the UK subsidiary company PSC register and the filing would be made at company's house. 
working up, the UK target company would have the UK Bidco as the PSC, because as we've explained, that is a registrable relevant legal entity. And looking into UK Bidco, the Luxembourg company is a relevant legal entity, but as we've explained, it's not registrable. Martin, do you want to take that? Yeah. So, so if we look at Lux Holdco, um, yeah, as Karina says, not registrable if it's not a listed company. And so we are looking for a majority stakeholder um, of that Luxembourg Holdco. And if we go from left to right, uh, we see an employee benefit trust. Uh, that's the acronym EBT. Uh, that owns just 10%, so we discount that as a majority stakeholder. The English Limited Partnership, or ELP, again, a 40% holding, so we discount that. Mr. X holds 24%, Mr. Y, 6%, so again, we discount them. And finally, the Y Family Trust holding 20%. So in terms of... Um, this structure, then uh, no one is a, a PSC of UK Bidco on the majority state principle. So um, let's let's imagine then that Lux Holdco was actually a UK company. Uh, that uh, that does change the analysis as as we highlighted earlier in the presentation. So we're now imagining that Lux Holdco is a UK company. Yeah. Um, so again, when we start to look left to right, yeah. uh, things start to change. Yeah, so the EBT, we can discount that. And the, e, the ELP, we need to look more into that. Now, as we've explained, it is a relevant legal entity. However, it's not registrable. So we'd have to move up and look at the UKLP and Mr W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as far as the English Limited Partnership is concerned, as Karina says, we look, we look through it. Uh, it doesn't have legal personality, and we have a UK LLP as the general partner. Uh, now, uh, English Limited Partnerships can't own assets in their own right, so they rely on their general partners to do that. And um, this uh, general partner is a, a UK body corporate, an LLP. So uh, it is a it is a registrable legal entity in the in the PSC register of this um, imagined UK hold co. Mm -hmm. um, the limited partner, Mr W, we would normally ignore because the legislation says uh, that if you're a limited partner and you're not exercising any management or control yeah. over either the uh, limited partnership um, or, or the UK company itself, then you're not going to be registrable. So certainly under condition 5B, which is what Mr W would have to consider, um, if, he, if he is simply a sleeping partner, in, injecting some capital but not interfering in management, then we, we would not consider registering Mr W. Uh, and Mr. the UK LLP, of course, will have its own PSC register. Yeah. So someone searching against the UK Holdco will, will find um, the UK LLP in the PSC register or the central register at Companies House. He can then go on to the LLP's PSC register to find out more about the ultimate ownership. That's right. Should we looking at Mr X and Mr Y? Mr X on his own wouldn't be a PSC because he holds less than 25% because it's more than 25% of the shares for you to be a PSC. And Mr Y only holding 6%, he also would not be the PSC. Yes, and, and then we, we come to the family trust. So again, um, we have to look at condition five yeah. because this is a trust. So the trust owns 20% and, and that uh, is, as Karina said, it's not more than 25%. So we would normally discount it, but we do have to consider 
some other things in relation to Mr. Y and the family trust. Mm. The first is whether there is uh, a joint arrangement between Mr. Y and the Y family trust. Mm. And that would be really some predetermined, preconceived arrangement to um, exercise the rights yeah. um, attaching to the shares in a certain way. Um, probably unlikely to happen in in the case of a trust that's professionally managed, but it's something that the officers need uh, of the UK company need to be alive to. And if there is a joint arrangement, then Mr. Y is treated as holding 26% of the shares, so he's registrable. Yeah. And the trustees of the family trust would also be registrable, not under condition five, because condition five is only looking for non-trustees who mm -hmm. might exercise significant influence or control mm -hmm. over the trust, but they'd be registrable under conditions one and two. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they would each be registrable, um, Mr. Z and uh, Ms. Z as well. Uh, in addition, the directors or officers of the UK Holdco would need to consider whether any other person uh, exercises significant influence or control over the trust. So we're, we're back to condition 5B. Is there a non-trustee exercising significant influence or control? Mm -hmm. Now that could be a beneficiary, yeah. it could be a protector, it could be uh, Mr. Y himself. Mm -hmm. um, and in that scenario, you may um, have to register again Mr. Y, this time not under a joint arrangement, but uh, on the basis that he might be exercising significant influence or control as a 6% shareholder. Mm. So again, you're aggregating his shareholding with, with the trust. Yeah. If, it's a, if it's someone other than Mr. Y, say a beneficiary who has no other shares in this structure, then that would un, be unlikely to matter for PSC purposes because the trust only owns 20%. Yeah. It, it could be as well that Mr X and Mr Y could have a joint arrangement too. Yes, yes, yeah. that, that's another possibility. So, so I think what the directors and officers have to do, um, bearing in mind, you know, the com criminal penalties, um, that they need to be taken seriously. On the other hand, one has to be reasonable. Yeah. And the law itself says directors and officers have to take reasonable steps. Mm. So. Um, I think they don't need to launch a, a detailed investigation if the um, on the face of it and from the documents and records at their disposal yeah. there, there's no real suggestion of a joint arrangement mm. um, or, or some individual effectively usurping yeah. the functions of the directors. Yeah. There, there is a lot to consider. There is, and the more we look at this, I think the more complex it appears. And albeit this is a, a relatively complicated structure, but as we've seen, certainly seen even today more complex structures than that in, yes. in, in our clients. So it's, it is um, certainly un, not uncommon. And um, and fascinating how small nuances can make a significant difference. Yeah, and I think the other thing we found when you actually apply this law to complex structure charts, mm -hmm. all sorts of um, ambiguities yeah. often arise from the legislation that you never suspected were there mm. until you actually um, try and apply the law. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so moving on to our last slide. Mm -hmm. in, in summing up, as you can see from the presentation, it's not black and white. It's not clear cut. The PSC regime is a complicated regime and it has to be looked at closely and must be considered in, in detail as we've seen from the previous slide. And so if there's a takeaway from today, it's make no assumptions. And uh, if you need assistance, please contact us. OK. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Karina. A fascinating um, canter through a complex um, 
subject matter, it, it certainly never fails to um, amaze me um, the, the levels of complexity that we can get very quickly from uh, legislation. Um, in this case, the PSC. So on screen, you can see um, Karina's email address. Karina's um, passed me across. Uh, we've had one or two questions already, so it's great. But Karina, there are um, more emails hopefully on their way. Email you can see on screen is Karina, the K K A R I N A dot James dash Wiltshire at Vistra dot com. Any, any, um, Questions be gratefully received. Um, we have had a, uh, I say, one question, two questions now. Um, how much is the fine for non-compliance, um, Karina? Or a, Martin? It's a level three, isn't it? Yeah, I think it depends um, on on the the nature of the offence and and the whether the conviction is on indictment mm -hmm. uh, before Crown Court, for mm -hmm. example. Um, or whether it's a, a, on summary conviction before the magistrate's court, but on, on tri when it when it's tribal on indictment, any conviction could carry a, uh, a fine of up, up to five thousand pounds. There are daily default fines. Yeah. The, the prison term that can be handed down by the Crown Court is two up to two years. Mm -hmm. um, before a magistrate, I think it's a year. Yeah. Um, we haven't yet had to consider these um, these penalties, other than in in theory, yeah. of course. And and our the, the clients we look after, our portfolio is um, is compliant and, and up to date. And I would imagine, um, uh, now, probably from now, I, I suspect that that Companies House has provided a bit of leeway yeah. up till now. I think this is the important thing, but they, they are, as Karina said, starting to get their act together. Yeah. Why is that? The reason is, uh, for political reasons, I think the UK regime was made a public regime. That's very controversial. Yeah. Um, there are concerns that its public nature militates against candid disclosure. So uh, in in the initial phase, as, as we commented on, a lot of errors mm. were manifest on this PSC register. So um, so the company's house have been clear, trying to clear this up yeah. uh, and, and being successful. But I have a feeling this gr there's been a kind of grace period for yeah. companies and officers. Uh, uh, and I think that's now over. Um, so I think everyone needs to be on their metal. Yeah. Company officers need to be um, happy that they're compliant, and if they're not sure, they should be um, seeking professional help. I think that that um, letter we seen earlier from Company's House is sort of a turning point for Company's House. They're obviously doing some, albeit maybe gross analysis um, and identifying PSCs where the numbers just don't add up to 100%. Um, the case of um, the, the example we've seen. Um, yeah, it, it just, I think more and more concentration has been put on it. Uh, we've got another question. Uh, I think we kind of covered this earlier, maybe a few, Corinna, but um, it's, it's uh, worth reiterating, I suppose. What can happen if my PSC is wrong? And um, I'm thinking of that bank example you had earlier. Yeah, so the banks, they do have access to company's house. And, As to all. Yeah, so they can just look on the face of it what is the PSC filings and if they don't add it up, they can refuse to renew a facility agreement, then the, the effects are, are devastating on a company. So it, it is, the implications that's, are- That's that you, them potentially out of business. That's, yeah. their, that's their pipeline, their uh, cash flow uh, stopped. Uh, that's their financing on their property, their asset. That's, that's potentially end of their business. Mm. Yeah. Very serious consequences. Again, the email address is on screen. Uh, Karina with a K A R I N A dot James dash Wiltshire at Vistra dot com for any more questions. Have we had any more through there, Karina? No, 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 no more through. We'll um, probably wrap it up about there then. Um, we do want to respect everyone's time, so if there's no further questions, we will wrap it up. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for joining us on a sunny day. Um,
if there's a bit of a noise in the background, our apologies. The, the guys next door in the building side have decided today is the day to pile drive, and it's obviously uh, maybe coming through slightly on the microphones, but I don't think it's too bad or certainly not too distracting. Um, hope you find the uh, session today useful, informative. Uh, any questions we get uh, after the event or that we didn't get round to answering, if there's any more coming through as I speak, we'll address by email after the event. Uh, we have made a recording of this webinar and it will be available to listen again from our website. So if you or your colleagues want to listen to it, you can do so. Please, uh, again, also keep an eye out for future free webinars on our website. We uh, put out, um, uh, as I say, a series. We've been doing it for nearly a year now of uh, webinars. But until the next time, thank you and goodbye.